Welcome, welcome. And you are watching Biblical Apologetics. I'm your host, Courtney Smith. And today we are here with Dr. Egal Gehrman, who is a biblical scholar, a messianic Jew, and an apologist. Today we're going to be discussing the Jewishness of the New Testament, and we're going to get his perspectives. I'm going to pick his brain a little bit. So, uh, Dr. Gehrman, how are you? All right. All right. Thank you so much, Courtney, for inviting me to your channel. It's a great privilege for me. Thanks a lot. No, no, the privilege is literally all mine. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I met, uh, let's see, it's been about three years ago now that I uh, met you through Dr. Michael Brown. Um, so I actually reached out to him to do some uh, translating. For those of you who don't know, he's fluent in, what is it, three languages? Right, right. Right, so, and that's a that's a pretty big accomplishment. So um, three languages, and so I reached out to him. And then, as you know, some of you on my channel know, my son had heart surgery and things had to get pushed back. And so here recently, I seen him popping up on YouTube doing interviews. So I emailed him and said, hey, you definitely got to come on my channel. I've got lots of people that would love to hear your um, your thoughts on things. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself right now. Just kind of introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, Courtney. So yes, just as you told, I'm a Messianic Jewish believer. I came to a personal faith in Yeshua HaMashiach in Israel. And um, I love learning the Bible and teaching it. I love theology, apologetics, and I'm very happy to uh, be a source of um, information on a variety of uh, biblical and theological questions. So it's a, your channel is a great one. I uh, checked it out and you had some wonderful interviews and uh, discussions that you have. And I think that we really, we really live in a time where people have a hunger for a deeper understanding of the Bible. And uh, it's the same in my heart. And uh, that's basically why I'm so excited to be here and uh, to share about God's word and uh, about uh, what the Spirit revealed to me. Amen. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people that are, I think we're in this very weird time where we have tons, and I know you're familiar with this, the uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement, which I think I would say that I am, quote, a part of because I'm a, a Christian that that decided I wanted to keep the Torah because I've seen the beautiful, um, the beauty in it. And so we're in this very weird time where we have Christians that are coming to the faith in Yeshua um, through a more Jewish understanding. And then um, what's weird also is we have people that are falling away from the faith. So it, it's this kind of weird balance that I that I see happening. And so I'd love, the lighting's great, perfect, I love it. Um, I'd love to um, pick your brain on some things. So I, I've got some questions. I broke them down into little categories. It's only a few questions, but hopefully it will give everyone a chance to really get to know you. So I have my, my script here, so I don't, <laughs> I'm known to run off on rabbit trails. So here we go. So question number one, what made you decide to go into the scholarly field of biblical studies? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Courtney. So um, when I came to faith uh, in Yeshua in Israel, I had a very uh, interesting spiritual journey from a semi-Jewish traditional home. Um, I was born in the former Soviet Union. Uh, so interestingly, when I immigrated with my parents, I was a small child uh, in 1991. And then um, growing up in Israel, in the Israeli educational system, uh, you are actually exposed to uh, to learning the Hebrew Bible right from grade one. Oh. And uh, I, I, I can say that it was my favorite discipline, learning the Torah. Uh, <laughs> although, of course, I wasn't a believer. I didn't know who God is. I didn't know anything about, you know, scripture. And I was very young at the time. But the <laughs> Lord really uh, he, uh, spoke, to a spoke to my uh, heart from his word. And then uh, as I was growing up, I was uh, practicing some Jewish traditions at home, if, along with my, my father, who was especially a, a spiritual seeker. And then, interestingly, um, there were two people who knocked on, on our door in Israel mm -hmm. and said, let's study the Bible with us. Would you like to do that? And we say, yes, why not? We didn't know what are their beliefs. And uh, uh, we found out that those were two Jehovah's Witnesses, two <laughs> Jewish men. Uh, who said, let's uh, just, we'll, we'll, we'll teach you any, everything about the Bible for free. We'll come to your place. And uh, of course, unknowingly, uh, in, as non-believers, we were actually introduced to this uh, cult. 
So eventually we found uh, ourselves at the local kingdom home uh, and uh, we thought that we know God, that we know the truth, that we know everything about the kingdom of God and all, all the literature and everything. And after spending seven years there, the Lord rescued us from this uh, spiritual deception in Israel. Uh, the Lord uh, spoke, I, I would say even to me, I was the first one in the family, although I was a teenager back then. Mm-hmm. But the Lord spoke to my heart and I really understood, uh, understood that it's not the right place to be. It's a spiritual dark place. Uh, with, with, it's fully heretical, a counter-biblical and very anti-Semitic. Uh-huh. And with all of this uh, realization, uh, the Lord rescued me and my family from this cult back in 2003. We came to local Messianic congregation in Israel uh, and came to faith in Yeshua in 2004. And since then, the Lord uh, kind of called me to be a biblical scholar. And uh, it was kind of that spiritual journey, uh, my personal background, um, a very good teaching that I received at my local Messianic congregation. So all mm-hmm. those factors actually uh, built a real uh, passion in my heart to pursue um, um, theological education, a uh, high-level theological education. So I really wanted uh, to uh, know God's truth. I wanted to mm-hmm. search the scriptures and uh, teach others God's word. And uh, that led me to pursue my um, undergrad degree in biblical studies in Israel, as well as my master's degrees mm-hmm. at Haifa University. So I completed uh, both my, my bachelor's and master's degrees in biblical studies at Haifa University mm-hmm. with um, very extensive um, um, education in terms of ancient Near East, ancient languages, uh, ancient uh, Jewish thought, Second Temple, Judaism, of course, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, mm-hmm. religious studies. And with this background, the um, Lord opened the door for me to continue my education in Canada. Uh, so I uh, pursued my doctoral degree uh, from 2008 to 2014. I graduated at the end of 2014 with my PhD uh, in theology with expertise in biblical studies. So I'm, I'm an Old Testament scholar or a Hebrew Bible scholar. Okay. But I have uh, also very um, a strong desire to share God's word, not just to keep it to myself. Yeah. Like, uh, we see that uh, in the academic world with many people who just keep their knowledge for themselves or just do their publications. But yeah. they really love, you know, reaching out to people uh, both in the church and in the academic world, uh, both Jews and Christians and Messianic believers. Um, and um, it's a real blessing uh, just to share what the Lord uh, has revealed to me from his word. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great testimony because... It's funny that you say that. I always tell people, in fact, when I spoke with uh, Dr. Michael Brown, I, I I put it on my channel and I said, you know, if you ever have a chance to talk to a scholar, you jump on that. You jump on that really quickly because they do a lot of publications. There's not very many scholars, although it's becoming, a, I think, a little more uh, popular for scholars to segue into social media. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, for the most part, scholars are not very accessible to the to the quote layman out there, to the average person. And that's why I wanted to have you on my channel. I can see that passion in you. I can see that that drive that you want to share what you you have and what you know. And and that's a beautiful thing. So it actually brings me to my next question. Uh, what kind of scholar would you consider yourself to be? Now, um, a lot of people don't know there's conservative scholars and critical scholars. Uh, where do you fall in the uh, scholarly spectrum? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's another great question, Courtney. So I personally approach the Bible as the living word of God. So I approach script, the Bible not just as some kind of an ancient Israelite document, like many, um, I would say, liberal or just non-believing yeah. scholars do. So uh, my approach in studying the scripture, in teaching it, is from a believing perspective. Because I'm a messianic believer, so I don't just come to the Bible like uh, people would do with uh, Enuma Elish or any any some kind of an ancient Canaanite text. Yes. So uh, I do believe that the books that we have in Scripture in the canon from the Book of Genesis through the Book of Revelation is the Word of God. It's the only uh, true revelation that uh, the one true living God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, revealed to us through the nation of Israel. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I do believe that it's uh, important not to label uh, myself as uh, putting myself in some kind of a camp, because uh-huh. uh, for some for some people, you you would put yourself in a conservative camp, and then they have their own idea what a conservative scholar means, right? Or yeah. you put yourself in a liberal, which of course I'm not, I'm not a liberal at all, but some would put you in that in that category. So I would uh, come to the Bible on its own terms as the word of God, 
And what is really important for me is studying and teaching the Bible within its ancient context. So, so I don't bring my own ideas into the biblical text. So okay. what I uh, strive to do is a close reading, is an exegetical analysis of the biblical text mm -hmm. as much as possible without any religious biases. So not even bringing my own uh, theological agenda into God's word. So I let God's word speak to my heart, to my life. And by doing that, I can help others see what the word of God means for them. Right. Uh, another important point that I wanted to uh, mention this, uh, Courtney, is that it's very important not to put uh, God as the author of scripture and his word into some kind of an um, some kind of an ideological box. And that's what we see uh, often happening in, even in the academic world and, and, and if, if in the Christian academic biblical studies as well or Jewish academic biblical studies, uh, you see that uh, each camp uh, attempts to uh, bring God to his own kind of fold. Uh, but but, that, but that's not, it's not, it's not the organic way to approach God's word. The Bible is a very dynamic book. Um, uh, some things are, are very clear and straightforward, but others are very complex. And uh, sometimes people think that there are some contradictions in the Bible. I don't believe that we have contradictions in scripture. I do believe in the inerrancy of scripture. But uh, even with uh, my theological uh, approach as a biblical scholar and uh, holding to the inerrancy of scripture, I do believe that there are some uh, complex biblical passages that we need to grapple with. And it takes times, uh, uh, it takes years even, uh, to, to, to come down to, to a solid understanding of certain uh, biblical questions. And for us as believers, uh, we have to contend for the faith of the gospel. Uh, and uh, biblical scholars who are believers, uh, they, they, I believe that it should be on their heart, it should be a priority of their life to bring the knowledge that they have to their congregations, to the, to, to the, to the larger community, uh, without any uh, religious biases or labeling uh, people or groups. Just come to scripture, study it, uh, to the best of your abilities, trust in God and see what God will do with this. Gotcha. Yeah. So a lot of what you said, actually, if we have time, I might squeeze in another little question for you if we have time. So um, the third the third question, um, with a plethora of Bible scholars out there, what do you feel like you bring to the table that makes you unique for the area of study that you've chosen. So I think you've studied uh, Jewish studies as your area. Is that right? Uh, so uh, primarily Hebrew Bible studies, uh, okay. but Jewish studies, um, yes. Uh, okay. It, it would be a subcategory of, of my expertise. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So um, what do you feel like you have that you want to leave behind as your legacy that three or four generations from now, they're going to look back and say, Dr. Gehrman was known for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a good question. Uh, so, um, of course, it's it's a work in progress. Like each one of us, you know, um, God is molding us and shaping us. And uh, I would say that uh, what I have really on my heart is this kind of an intersection between two disciplines, uh, maybe even three disciplines, uh, biblical studies in general, mm -hmm. uh, and then biblical theology as a sub um Subdiscipline of biblical studies and apologetics. Uh -huh. So, and, and and this kind of a, a you know a merging of those three disciplines is, is despite a unique approach to to theology at large, I would say, uh, because most biblical scholars they just tend to focus on the ancient context of scripture, history, geography, culture, languages, which is very important. Those are the tools that are given to us. Right. But at the same time, I think uh, what we do with scripture and how it speaks to us today, how relevant is what we do with scripture, I think is very, very important because so many people, according they just leave the faith, you just, you just mentioned it, uh, even Messianic believers and Christians, and you have even Jewish people who are not, have nothing to do with, with the New Testament, and even they leave uh, behind even the, the concept of faith in God, the, the concept of the sacredness of the Torah. So, so in, in my approach, uh, Courtney, um, you know, bringing the relevance of scripture, okay, may, so that the Bible comes alive, that's, that's really the desire of my heart, and I, I pray and believe that, that this is kind of the, that, that specific calling that they have from, from God in, in, this, I, in this direction. 
I can see that. And it's so, it's so nice to find someone that's so passionate. Um, I, you know, you've, you've worked with Dr. Brown and I can see his passion too and his fire. And so it's, it's nice to also see um, that in you as well. And, and I know that um, it, it's one of those things where many people may not know very quickly the difference between biblical theology and biblical studies. Do you want to quickly break that down for them? Oh, yes, yes. It's, it's a good question. So uh, biblical theology has actually two um, sub-categories, um, I would say. Biblical theology of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. So uh, with this discipline, scholars actually attempt to understand um, what kind of a theological message we uh, is conveyed from uh, Genesis through the book of Malachi, or if we go with the Hebrew canon of the Bible from Genesis to Second Chronicles. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's basically that kind of a question. And there, there's a lot going on in the field of what we call Old Testament theology, which is really exciting. Yes. Uh, and then we have this, the second half of the Bible, of course, the New Testament. So there we have the, the biblical theology of the New Testament. So their scholars deal with the New Testament on its own kind of on its own merit in a sense of understanding uh, the canonical uh, theological questions that are uh, discussed and, 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 and packed within the New Testament writings. Of course, with, within the context of the Hebrew Bible and Second Temple Judaism. So uh, basically, uh, biblical theology is a very important discipline and uh, it's part of biblical studies uh, and, and, and it does relate to other theological disciplines like systematic theology mm -hmm. or apologetics okay. or uh, even church history or just, you know, uh, general religious studies. Right, right. Right. Yeah. No, um, I have a lot of studious people that watch my channel, um, but there's still some people that may not actually understand the academic semantics of the breakdown there. And so thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to ask you the final question in this little um, category. Uh, oh, no, I think that was the final question. The plethora of. Yeah, I think that was it. OK, so now, mm -hmm. sorry, we're going to be moving on to threats within the bodies, uh, the body of believers. Now, there are multiple threats. I kind of mentioned that at the beginning. You have people, you have Christians that are deconstructing. You have Christians that are becoming atheists. You have Christians that are new aging their way into, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, which is, I think, a very scary thing. And then you have um, what, a very interesting dynamic from what I'm hearing um, out of some of my messianic friends in Israel, that the rise in messianic belief is happening. It's coming up in Israel. Um, and then you have the fall of American believers, which is, I don't know if that's prophetic. That's interesting, but it, it nonetheless is something that I think needs to be noted. So with that being said, what do you think is the single biggest threat to the body of believers mm -hmm. currently? Yeah, um, I would say that it's not just one single threat, Courtney. There are many fold threats to, to the body of Christ today. And I just uh, want to highlight some of the most prominent ones. There are many more. I would say that uh, theological liberalism Ooh, is, yeah. a, is, a, is a real, real, real threat to the entire body of Christ, theological liberalism. Basically, you have uh, pastors, theologians, um, just lay believers, both Messianic communities and evangelical churches and the wider church. And, just, and they just come to, to the Bible with their own ideas, with their own agenda. And, and they are taking a very dangerous step because they are actually diverting from the word of God. They say, for example, we are not sure about the resurrection of Yeshua, whether he's truly God. Uh, we don't know whether the Hebrew Bible is actually inspired word of God. And, and whether miracles are true or not, you know, and, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So I would say that theological liberalism is, is one of the greatest threats. Another one that I would highlight uh, is that, unfortunately, we see many believers stepping into the occult. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a very, very dangerous trend. Uh, I don't know if you, ever, if, if you recently heard about a new trend among evangelical believers uh, with the uh, Enneagram. Oh, you know, yes. Yeah, yes. I have I have some friends that are involved. They're like, "Hey, you should do that." I'm like, "No, thank you." <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. and this practice is definitely an uh, a colleague one. So, mm -hmm. so, so people are actually tapping into the in the spiritual darkness without even realizing that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have so many Christians that are practicing different forms of uh, pseudo spirituality uh, with uh, different strange ideas and practices, like even the uh, 
sucking the grace of the saints, you know, sucking the energies, you know, happening in, in some churches here in the United States, you know? Yes. And, yes. and you know, so many weird, you know, even reading some uh, tarot cards, you know, for mm. Christians saying that it's, you know, God will reveal to you something from that. Yeah. Just looking at that makes you feel that that whether you are in a Christian church or biblically speaking, in light of Revelation chapter two and three, it's like the synagogue yeah. of Satan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just speaking, you know, straightforward about it. You know, we have Christians celebrating Halloween, and and they think it's all right, no matter. Yeah. So we have different practices and beliefs and occult ideas that that you definitely see. They're counter biblical. They are not from the Holy Spirit. And they contradict and uh, God's word. So that would in, that would be number two. And number three, in terms of the big threats, I would even add um, lack of spiritual discernment. Lack of spiritual discernment. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, because you, you see so many believers that are just just the lack of spiritual discernment in terms of what they watch, even on on the internet, YouTube channel, you know, sermons, videos. Uh, many buy into different French theories and ideas. Even about the Jewish people, about the nation of Israel, uh, you have the Hebrew Black Israelites. You have so many different fringe groups out there. Even among uh, some Hebrew roots people and Messianic believers, uh, you know the flat Earth idea, <laughs> and, and all of these. You know, just you know, you name them. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but you are hitting the nail on the head. Like, yes, I just want to say amen after every single one of those. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and those are real questions. People are, are grappling yeah. with them. Uh, but uh, it's it's one it's one thing, you know, that you, we want to ask a question, but it's other thing, you know, that you teach false doctrine. And 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 here is there is a line that we have to draw. And and then in terms of um, Courtney, in terms of specific doctrinal threats that I personally notice uh, specifically for the uh, evangelical church. So I just have a short list. Uh, for example, antinomianism. You know, mm -hmm. people say that we just live by grace. We don't deal with God's law at all. And, and you have a big spectrum there. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, hardcore cessationists about uh, the, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, denying the work and, and the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, you have supersessionism. Uh, you know, replacement theology, uh, yeah. which leads very easily to Christian anti-Semitism. Anti it, it's all it's all here. It's all just maybe in, in our churches, in our congregations. People believe in how to those believe, with, along with their pastors. And then you have Marcionism. You know, <laughs> people who, who deny downplay the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. You, know, you have preachers who, who teach that we need to detach from the Old Testament. Yeah. And they're, and they're given big platforms. And they have, like, big following. Uh, yeah, I and and I don't mean to interrupt, but I just you are just on point. I cannot agree with you enough. Your your every aspect. I think you've really thought this out really well, and I think this is something that most academic can see and pick up on. But it's not it's not expressed how dangerous these things are, and I think it comes from a fundamental lack of teaching your Old Testament Bible. I just think exactly. that's right, 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 Courtney, right, exactly. And then then you have, for example. Um, um, a problem like uh, eschatological deviations. Okay. I have people who, who deny the future uh, millennial kingdom of Christ. Okay. Uh, they, they deny the future salvation of Israel. Uh, you have preterists oh, saying man. that ever, the full preterism, saying that uh, all the prophecies got fulfilled by 70 AD. You know, you have yeah. nothing. To no. I don't Did know how to get there. I don't, I, I've tried to understand. I can't. I can't. Yeah. yeah you, you have um, amillennialism, a postmillennial. Just some examples. And again, I'm not speaking any judgmental um, sentiment at all, at all. I'm just listing those spiritual threats that exist, and people have to be aware of them. Right. And then, I, if 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 we can just spend maybe uh, two, three minutes more on on the question of threats, uh, there are some threats specifically for the messianic believers that that, that I notice. For example, uh, you have Unitarian theology, which is counter biblical in in their, in their own version. Their own Unitarian version, for example, denying that Yeshua is fully God, fully right. man, which is which is one of the fundamental doctrines of the biblical faith, and right. it's nothing okay. to do with, it has nothing to do with the Catholic Church at all. It's been just about the Bible itself, from Genesis to, to Revelation. Uh, then you have, for example, uh, denying the Spirit of God. So basically, those are uh, uh, cultic features that you will find in those cults, cults like the JW or the Mormons or the Seventh Day Adventism. You know, 
Um, then you have those Messianic believers or some are Hebrew roots that would deny the sufficiency of scripture. They would go to all those kinds of apocryphal books and uh, rabbinic writings and some, you know, some uh, even, I'm, I'm not even sure that there is a reliable source like the book of the Yashar and mm. a variety of different books that are, that are, their names are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. They're, they're not those books that were actually right. holding and reading. <laughs> You know, so lots of spiritual confusion. Uh, then you have the, the teaching of the Kabbalah. Uh, you have Messianic believers and even pastors and rabbis who would teach the Kabbalah. And they would say, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. It's, 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 a, it's a teaching from God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unknowingly, again, they're tapping into the occult. Um, then another thing that, that I noticed, it's, it, it's, and it, it's in both the church and the Messianic world, that believers are building walls. Walls. Mm -hmm. Instead of bridging, uh, instead of building bridges of peace, they are building walls oh, and barriers between themselves and others. Yeah. And then you have all, all, of, all kinds of the traditions and the denominational hierarchies, and and so many things that you know churches and congregations they built up like layers upon layers upon layers. And then the believer is spiritually lacking. His heart, his soul is thirsty. He's mm -hmm. hungry for the truth. He's hungry for deeper. Uh, understanding of God, of Scripture, of his of his own life, and so many believers they even find a hard time to find a good local Bible church in, nowadays. Yes, yes, I I know it's difficult for us being uh, messianic or Torah observant. There's just now we have a local place, um, and the thing is, is you know the great thing about it is the the rabbi teaches what's tradition and what's you know, actually found in the Torah, but um, it's it's not quite fully my whole style, right? It's it still mm -hmm. leans kind of a little bit more towards um, more Messianic Judaism than what I would consider myself. I definitely consider myself a Christian, but I do keep um, more of the law of God than most. So, uh, all right, so let's get into the next question. All right, so this one's gonna be a fun one, okay? So <clears throat> we're going to discuss, actually, you know what? Can we talk a little bit about the threat from anti-missionaries? You know, I don't, let's, let's go back to this. Let's go back to this because my channel, I don't know if you've looked at it. Um, my channel, because I did just mis mention Messianic Judaism, my channel is really geared towards countering um, anti-missionaries like Tobias Singer and uh, Jews for Judaism, because first of all, the re let me explain why I do this. I don't feel like it's an accurate representation of Judaism. They're, I think they're what I call knee-jerk reaction Judaism to the New Testament. It's essentially, oh no, we have this thing, this Jewish document, this New Testament, the, these Jews who lived in the time of the second temple, and we don't agree with them. We don't have a temple now. So now we have to develop apologetics to counter them because they say that Yeshua is the Mashiach and we can't agree with that. And so I feel like at that point is when Judaism took a hard divide because there was a lot of what you see, like you have the, the two powers in heaven theology, and you can see this divine Messiah coming out of the text, the Hebrew Tanakh in general. But we see at that point after Yeshua, that's when the hard, no, he's not divine. No, he never was supposed to be divine. No, there was never supposed to be two coming. So if you don't mind, let's talk just a quick bit about that, because that's really what my channel is geared towards. So the question is, how do you feel about the threat of anti-missionaries against the body of believer? Do you have a high level of concern, low level or somewhere in the middle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I would say that I do have a very high level of concern for uh, for uh, the whole movement of uh, counter uh, messianic um, Jewish rabbis who attempt to discredit the New Testament and um, actually, um, you know, um, raise some objections to the messiahship of Yeshua and the integrity of the New Testament as a Jewish book as a, as mm -hmm. Uh, with unity with the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. So when I see uh, Curtin uh, working with Dr. Michael Brown and uh, doing my own uh, work countering those uh, counter, uh, counter those anti-Messianic or anti counter. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I think so. they like to be called counter-missionary, but I call them what they are, anti-missionary. They are anti-missionary. 
exactly, exactly. And uh, what I see uh, that at times they even uh, target not just the Messianic Jews, they even target Gentile Christians. Amen. And Gentile Christians are not prepared to give an answer in light of 1 Peter 3.15. They don't, they're not ready. Yes. Again, it has to do with um, lack of foundational knowledge of, of, of biblical theology, um, not, not sufficient discipleship in the local churches. So there are many other factors. But yes. in my opinion, every believer, every Bible-believing Christian or Messianic Jew has to be prepared to give an answer for his hope. And that's why apologetics is so important, in particular messianic apologetics. And I, I, I and it's a wonderful YouTube channel that you have, Corgan, that you're doing this work because there, I don't think there are many others who would do, I mean, even just raise those questions. Of course, Dr. Brown is doing that, but apart from him, if you can name maybe a few, few other people, I think David Wilbur, our yes. common friend, uh, he, he's working in that direction as well. Right. But to Rabbi say, Eduardo. Rabbi Eduardo. Um, he's a messianic rabbi, uh, got, uh, yeah. So, but he's, he's fixing to start putting out, but yeah, you're totally right. There's not very many of us out yeah, there. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, so I, I believe Courtney that we have to team up, uh, all of us to, 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 you know, to break ground in this direction, to, uh, answer those objections, to, uh, uh, raise those questions with the local pastors or the local le church leaders, uh, organized Bible classes. Uh, organized Bible conferences. There are so many things that, that, that can be done to just help raise the spiritual awareness of the body of Christ. Even, you know, just basic things like biblical literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is, there is a real problem of biblical illiteracy mm -hmm. in the contemporary church. And um, so we are here to equip believers. We are equipped. God is equipping all of us. Nobody's uh, better than others or holier than thou approach. It's not, a, it's not my approach at all. Uh, I'm personally humbly learning from many other great scholars and, uh, and, uh, and we all should just grow in that and mature. So yeah, we all have to stand and contend for the faith of the gospel uh, and uh, just help those who are spiritually deceived because there are many of them. I just uh, spoke to one guy from uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, he was a student of mine at Shiloh University and he's also a, a Messianic believer, although he's not Jewish, but very much kind of observing God's word and, and uh, has a heart for Israel, a uh, wonderful man of God. And he told me that there, there's, there are even families or even congregations in different parts of the United States, I think he mentioned even Florida and other parts, where, where they're, just, just, they're just departing from the faith. They're just leaving, forsaking the faith in, in Yeshua, in the gospel, in the New Testament, maybe even in the entire Bible, I don't know. I mean, and it's happening and happening. It's kind of a spiritual apostasy downfall. The one is predicted in the Bible. We're not surprised about it, but we have to do something with it. We are not just to see it and just see what is taking place. Yeah, yeah. You bet. That's actually where my heart is at. So um, very quickly, I, I started this because, um, you know, as a as a I was born and raised mostly mainstream Christian Baptist Methodist. I grew up in about 10 plus years ago. Um, I was I kind of through a conspiratorial way. Um, God revealed to me that Torah is still something we should be looking at. We should not be antinomian. We should not be anti-law. We should really look at the Jewishness of the New Testament, not separate ourselves or unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, as some people have said. And so I started to really study. And then I wasn't the only one. I realized I wasn't the only one. There was thousands of other Christians, I, really right around 2008, nine is when the, the movement really picked up speed. And so um, very shortly after that, I started to notice it because you now have Christians that have a desire, a very earnest and beautiful desire to keep the law. You now make it easier for anti-missionaries to just pick you off especially if you're not really rooted in Yeshua and you're not really rooted in Paul and you don't understand how Paul preaches and teaches. And, and so I would really sum up my channel with, of course, Peter, you know, be ready at all times to give an account for the faith, you know, that's in you and the hope that's in you. Um, but John 1 45, which basically tells us we have found the one in which the law and the prophets write about. That's what my channel is devoted for. Um, and so 
I appreciate you being here and, and, and talking about everything. So if it brings glory um, to God, you know, it, it's, it's what I'm here for. So yeah, if, if you ever have any um, rallies or anything that you feel like you can plant, which we'll get to that later on, but if you feel like, yeah, we got to stand together, lock arms to really um, protect the younger generations coming, because I, I really truly can see this now where, will there be any faith left? when Yeshua comes. Like it's, it's a scary thing to see that you're living in Bible prophecy as it unfolds. Now I can't say that I know when Yeshua is going to return, I'm certainly not a date setter, but it is one of those scary things that when we see people fall away, it's sad, but we know it was predicted. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's disciple some people really quick. Let's talk about the Jewish concepts in the new Testament that um, non-Jewish readers might miss. So whenever you read the New Testament, now I know that you you focus mostly on the, the Tanakh or the Old Testament, but whenever you personally read the New Testament as a Messianic Jew, do you see anything in particular that maybe let's say a non-Jewish reader wouldn't really pick up on because you know, they're, they're not Jewish. Like the example I always give is, is the woman with the issue of blood reaching out and touching Yeshua's tzitziot or tassels or border or edge of his garment. And so they may not understand the significance of that. So what do you, do you have any other examples for us? Yeah. Yeah. Courtney, yeah. There are some great examples in the new Testament and we could, we could just go page by page by page in the gospels and in the book of Acts and then Paul's uh, letters and Peter's and Jews and the book of Revelation. Uh, just to, to to give kind of a very um, remarkable example is the one that we find in John chapter 7. Uh, in John chapter 7, we find Yeshua uh, preaching to his contemporaries on the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and, and that's a lovely picture. It's an imagery of, of God actually uh, uh, bringing in some of the uh, contemporary Jewish traditions, which are not uh, recorded precisely in the, in the Torah or in the Hebrew Bible, but then he should uses them in order to make a point for himself, in, in order to make a point in his uh, preaching. And uh, if you don't mind, I, I can just turn to scripture, to John chapter 7, uh, and just um, show I might, where... Where is it at? I, I might even can, can get it pulled up for us right quick. What, what passage? Oh. Let's see. John yeah. 7? Uh, it's John chapter 7. Do you prefer any translation? Uh, not really. Um, I have right here uh, the ESV Bible. Okay, let's see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Okay, that way, uh, let's see if we can't get that yeah. pulled up for everyone. Let's sure. see. Oh, what? You can go ahead and start reading if you if you'd uh -huh. like. I just want everyone to be able to see it as well. Okay, yeah. So even if you look at uh, starting at verse one, John seven from verse verse one, and after Jesus went about in Galilee, he would not go about in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews. Feast of Booths was at hand. Okay, so here we have this interesting reference in John chapter 7 to the Feast of Booths. Okay, what feast is this? Right, it's one of the three pilgrimage feasts that the Lord ordained for the people of Israel in the, in the in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, right? The Feast of Sukkot, right? So one of the uh, great uh, regalim, that's, that's the Hebrew word for, uh, for uh, the pilgrimage feast. And then interestingly, we see that there is an entire teaching revolving around the Feast of Sukkot in the way that it was celebrated by Second Temple uh, Jews, uh, the contemporaries of Yeshua. So we see, for example, if we look uh, down to verse uh, 37, what happens on the last day of the feast? The last day of the feast, the great day. Okay, and then we see, okay, feast, we know what kind of a feast is this, right? That's the Feast of Sukkot. That is given to us in the biblical text, but... What is this interesting expression, the great day? Oh, here we have an interesting Jewish insight that we would just understand if we would actually dig into the context in the Jewish context of this festival, right? So that's the day that is, that is known as Hoshana Rabbah. It's the last day of the, of, of the Feast of Sukkot, right? The Feast of, so Hoshana Rabbah means, uh, Lord, we beseech you, save us. Hoshana Rabbah, okay? So Rabbah is... Uh, actually, an exclamation towards God, the great God, the great Lord, and Hoshana, save us. We ask you, Lord, we beseech you, save us. Okay. So interestingly, there is that's the point. And basically, on this day, on the last day of the of the great salvation, right, uh, the the last day of the feast of Sukkot, Jesus stood up and cried out, "If anyone thirsts, let him let him come up, let, let him come to me and drink." 
Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Mm -hmm. So it was all related to a water ceremony. Yes. That the Jews would practice in the uh, in around the temple in ancient uh, Jerusalem. Okay, so it brings so much so much light and and color to the understanding of of the words of Jesus. So now we see the relationship between the feast of Sukkot, the last day of the feast, and the and, and the water of life. Amen. Okay? And then we see that in verse um, uh, verse thirty eight, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, that out of his heart will flow the rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit. Whom, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So here we, here we go. So you see that Yeshua uses one ancient Jewish custom, and he brings into the gospel into it, right? And then he proclaims it with, with such a boldness and power. And uh, if you don't mind, Courtney, I, I just got one text here that I wanted to cite from ancient Jewish sources specifically related to John chapter 7, and I'm going to read from the Jewish Annotated New Testament. Uh, ah, Amy, Amy, I've tried to get her to come on the show. She, she's wonderful. So Yeah, and, and then, um, according, so here we have this interesting text. It's on page 192 Okay. Uh, this commentary. So it says, the rabbis emphasized the joy that accompanied this ceremony. Anyone who has never seen the rejoicing at the place of water drawing. So here, here we have this celebration of the, uh, the, the practice of the water drawing has never seen rejoicing in all his days. And that's a text from uh, from the ancient Jewish rabbis. And then it says, uh, last day, Hoshana Rabbah, meaning the great Hoshana, the culmination of these prayers. And then when we when we see Shok says, right, the scripture has said in verse 38, he actually quotes from a number of passages. It's not just, not just like one text. Mm -hmm. So he quotes from texts like Proverbs 18.4, Isaiah 44.3, Isaiah 58.11. So we, we see kind of a, um, you know, this kind of a chain of, of biblical text that Yeshua quotes and um, how nicely he uses this ancient Jewish tradition and brings life into it. You, you know, that's, that's beautiful. I, I love that you bring that up that um the like yeshua himself will take passages from a uh, little snippets from multiple passages and piece it together in one see this is a problem for anti-missionaries it's weird i don't know why this is a problem for them because uh their own uh, you know rishonim and chazal they they do the same thing they will quote from one passage pull from this passage and then say that it's related to this passage when clearly it's not um but for some reason, if Paul does it, because Paul's really big about doing that. And that's why I say if Paul, in my humble opinion, he's a he's a wonderful commentator. And uh, if he were, um, let's say if he were put in the, t if I were to tell a uh, like a Jew that doesn't really know the New Testament, I were to read a passage from Paul's writings. And let's say the passage doesn't mention Yeshua or anything. It's just an actual commentary. Um, for example, on Isaiah 27, it's one of my favorite ones that uh, Paul mentions three passages, Isaiah 27, 59, and Jeremiah 31. He pulls from all three of those to not only explain the gospel to you, but explain when it will come, how it will come, and by whom it will come. And that's why he uses those three passages. But I guarantee you, if I were to do that and explain that to a Jew who was not necessarily very learned in the New Testament, he would ask me, so which sage said that? Because it's nearly identical the way Paul writes, because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He he would have, if he wasn't a non-believer or a a um, a believer in Yeshua, he would have been, I guarantee you, put in um, you know, Mishnah and Talmud and things like that. So um, but I, it's interesting that you you mentioned that Yeshua did the same thing because in my humble opinion, in order to fully study your Bible, which is bringing me to my next question that's kind of uh, off the cuff that I said I might have time to get to. Um, in my humble opinion, you really got to be able to understand the, the layout of scripture, the concepts that you find in the scriptures, or else you're you're really just reading the Bible like a story. You're flipping and and you you don't really understand the depth of it. So teaching the the big concepts, you know, the resurrection concept, and you teach, you know, about the the law and and how that's applicable, how that looks like um, it's pushing you forward towards the one that who is going to be the big savior. 
things like that, or else you're just going to be reading the Bible and you're going to be missing a lot of things. Um, it's like talking past each other when it comes to, um, you know, like speaking to someone in a different language. If you don't know the meanings of the words that they're saying, then it's just, you're just hearing it. You're not actually absorbing it. So brings me to my next question. It's totally off the cuff. So you mentioned earlier about you um, academically, you have to come to the text without reading in your own bias or your own, um, you know, upbringing or where you're at now. So do us a favor. Tell us a little bit about how you personally think that one should approach the text without leaving um, anything out and without bringing in too much eisegesis or reading into the text. Because it's, I think we all come to the text with a little bit of bias in some way, but how do we how do we be as honest with the text as possible, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question, Courtney. So it's basically kind of a lesson in um, hermeneutics. <laughs> you know, uh, how do you analyze the biblical text? So there are many things that, uh, that can be said about this. Um, I would highlight a couple of the ones that, are, that really stand out to me. Um, for example, uh, it's very important when studying God's word uh, not to come with your own traditional understanding of scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, there are good things with our traditions, whether they're Jewish, Messianic Jews, or even just Christian. Yeah. But when we bring those traditions, we just bring their uh, kind of uh, their pre uh, preconceptions, their assumptions about God, about the gospel, about Jesus, about, um, about uh, suffering in the world and various other questions. Mm -hmm. But we, ha we have to, to let the Bible speak for itself in terms of uh, asking the hard questions. And, and we, we see this happening a lot uh, with the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. We see this with, with men like Habakkuk, with Job, uh, with other men uh, like uh, David or Asaph in, in the Psalms, right? So, so I think it's very important to, 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 uh, to come to Scripture uh, courageously, um, with, a, with a real hunger and an anticipation of what would God tell you, how he would uh, open up the scripture for you. We have this great example of the disciples at the road, on the road to Emmaus, in Luke chapter 24, after Yeshua's resurrection, right? And he would open up the scripture for them. And he would start with the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Mm -hmm. so I do believe that with any uh, Bible study that we do, we always have to go to the roots I always have to go to the Torah, the, the, uh, the, the prophets and the writings, and then see how it all points to the New Testament. So, and, mm -hmm. uh, so of course, uh, the context of each verse of the entire chapter and then the context of the entire book is, is, is kind of, those are the keys. Without them, we won't be able to, to, to get anywhere. Uh, then I would uh, mention the importance of biblical languages, uh, in mm -hmm. particular Hebrew. Of course, Greek is still very important for us, but even uh, with knowledge of good Greek, you won't be able to under understand many of the Judaic, Hebraic yeah. concepts that are ingrained within the New Testament. That's so right. in my opinion, understanding and learning even basic biblical Hebrew is, would, would really, really, really help us and get us some tools and some more confidence in the way that we understand the Bible, the way that we learn, the, the way we teach it uh, to other people and the way that we can handle various difficult questions. Because we, uh, we have to realize that we live in a time when there are so many resources out there online and in our libraries, and, and there are f thousands of opinions and, 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 and perspectives on any given spiritual question. And at times, you know, you, you, you get confused. You don't know how to navigate through these uh, muddy waters. Uh, so here again, we have those tools that are given to us in the Bible, contextual reading, a close analysis, uh, and uh, just uh, and um, I would say my major methodology, biblical uh, study, is a uh, literal, plain reading of the biblical text, grammatical, historical analysis. Okay, yeah. so we are not supposed to spiritualize things. We're not, <laughs> we are not supposed to to, uh, to to read some kind of an allegories into the Bible. They are yeah. not good. Okay, we have to come to the biblical passage, understand its uh, literary genre. Of course, it's important. Right, and then go from there, and, and there are of course levels and, and steps which uh, we would take in a particular order in our Bible study. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, the, kind of the foundations of my my channel here is um, 
the Peshat level of the text. I'm very much, which is the plain level of the text. I'm big into this. So um, I kind of, I found that over-spiritualizing is really what gave um, the claw, gave the, um, the grip of the anti-missionary to really get into things when it comes to, you know, when we over spiritualize a text, they go, look, that's not what it says. It has nothing to do with Jesus. If you just look at this and it'll read this, it'll tell you it's about someone else or something. So if we just over spiritualize, we open up the door to get really hammered by anti-missionary. So I, I agree completely. And as far as, you know, um, Isaiah one tells us, come, let us reason together. You know, what's interesting if the Lord God himself, if Hashem himself, right, he comes and says, come, let us reason. Should we not say that even more to each other? Come, let us reason. If we don't agree, let's talk about it. Let's figure out why. Let's maybe, you know, something I don't know. I think that's important, too. It's very important for me, which is why I am not big on hanging out in echo chambers. I am known for branching out and and putting my feelers out there to find people who may not agree with me or who may can offer me more knowledge because I'm, I'm constantly thirsting. And unfortunately in the Hebrew roots movement, there is a lack of really good scholarship. Now there's a few out there that I can name, but there's a lack of really good scholarship and it comes from being jaded because we're a little, we're a little hurt that the um, mainstream Christian church, we feel like we've been lied to that, Really, his mom never called him Jesus. His mom actually called him Yeshua. Like we feel a little hurt that these things that we should have been discipled in church with, we weren't. And so we get a little scared to listen to anybody. And so thank God he humbled me. God humbled me and pulled me out of that mentality. So since then, I have been all for learning as much as I can learn from scholars because we're we're standing on the backs of giants and Unfortunately, I feel like our giants are getting smaller and smaller and smaller because we are getting further and further and further from the actual text itself. And so the more we um, we raise up children to not really uh, study the actual Old Testament Bible, um, the more we're not going to understand our New Testament Bible. So it's important for me to raise my children to understand the, the Tanakh so that they, when, even if you can't read Greek, you'll know the concepts that are in there as we were talking about the, the Jewishness of the New Testament. All right. So I have one uh, last question for you. Now, I've really enjoyed having you on, and I think that you are going to have a lot to offer the world. I think you have a very interesting uh, background and coming out of Jehovah's Witness. Um, actually, I have a few Jehovah's Witness friends. They're very nice people. Um, we just disagree theology wise on some things. So what are you currently working on that you feel inspired? And I mean, just absolutely inspired to share with the rest of the world, because I'm going to put it in the description box, your lectures, your videos, all of that. Where can people find you? Mm, yeah. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah. So um, I work on a number of projects right now. Uh, there are uh, several directions. Um, one is my online Bible school. So I have an online Bible school launched back in 2018. It's called Yesod Bible Center, Yesod Min Foundation. Uh, so I do teach um, um, a variety of live online Bible courses, academic uh, level uh, Bible courses, uh, ranging from the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, uh, Jewish-Christian relations, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Biblical Hebrew, Modern Hebrew, as well as others. Uh, just uh, last Sunday, I finished teaching a class on the book of Zechariah. Ooh. Really fascinating. It was the first time that I taught it in a course format. Wow. And uh, it, it, it was a great experience personally for myself because I discovered so many things uh, preparing you know, each class that were re really amazing. Uh, so I have this uh, kind of a project. It's called Yesod Bible Center. And there is a website called yesodbiblecenter.org. You can easily find it even just by Google, Googling it. Uh, so that's that's one. Uh, another one, another project uh, that I really want to share with you, Courtney, and with uh, all those, with our viewers and our friends, is my new apologetics ministry. Um, it's called the International Biblical Apologetics Association. Uh, and, um, it, and so we have a separate website for this. It's called uh, BibleApologies.org. Very easy. BibleApologies.org. Um, we uh, there is a YouTube channel, and actually there are two YouTube channels for this uh, website: one in Russian and one in English. 
maybe God willing down the road we'll be one in Hebrew as well. Uh, but uh, there's lots of work to be done, God willing, and uh, many, many other projects. So with this, um, with uh, the IBA ministry there, uh, so uh, the first foundational project was uh, our apologetics declaration. So uh, we released it last year. It's not just me and uh, um, our team, other men, believers, including some pastors and theologians uh, from uh, different countries uh, with the input of Dr. Michael Brown and other scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's also available on the website on babaapologist.org. You can read it. You can download it. It's available in 17 languages in PDF files. It's, it's a foundational document of our ministry. And uh, my ministry is non-denominational, is messianic, evangelical, and biblical. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's how I approach this ministry. So that's kind of the, the first um, um, and co a small accomplishment of our ministry with respect to this declaration, which people can read and sign and share and, and send yeah, others. Yeah. And uh, my, other, my other project that is a work in progress is my... Uh, is my counter cult book, uh, um, which I completed writing, uh, or actually addressing uh, the most active uh, pseudo Christian cults in Israel. Wow. Uh, so those are the JJW and the SDA, the Seventh Advance. And oh, I know, really? Yes, and I know uh, both very well, and they are very much the same <laughs> in many, many respects, both in doctrine and in practice. And they're, they're and the people, and the, I reach out to those people with the gospel, to mm -hmm. to to help them see the light of Christ and leave those organizations, and come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus of the Lord Yeshua, because both ex specifically, according just to uh, switch the gears, uh, you know, th those two groups, uh, specifically those two groups, they they are very much um, um, detached from the Jewish roots of the gospel, very much detached. Uh, uh, the roots are uh, are occultic, uh, actually Masonic, to be even more precise. Uh, so complete spiritual darkness. Uh, both Ellen G. White, uh, the prophetess of the SDA Church, um, was not a true prophet. She was a false prophetess, a false false teacher. Um, likewise, the founder of the JW cult, Charles Des Russell, um, who was an Adventist himself. Oh. He, 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 so basically, the the, the, J, the JW is just an offshoot of the larger SDA movement, that's all. It, uh, we, it, it's hard for me to believe that those movements are popular, but Messianic Judaism in itself is not as, well, I guess it's coming up now, but is, are they yeah. more popular than Messianic Judaism? Um, no, I wouldn't say they're more popular in Israel, Kurt, oh, I okay. wouldn't say that, but they are, uh, they're presenting a real threat to the body of Messiah in Israel. Ah. And, and the Messianic movement in Israel is not equipped at all with, with, with countering them biblically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I just finished writing a whole, you know, academic level uh, with uh, hundreds of footnotes, a uh, book in Hebrew for the Hebrew readers, for the Israeli community of believers, actually speaking to those issues, uh, raising the awareness and uh, equipping the believers with knowledge to reach out to those people with the gospel so that they might leave the darkness and come into the light of Christ, of Yeshua. So I'm very passionate about this project and I do hope and believe that down the road, the, once the book is uh, published in Hebrew, it will be translated to Russian and English as well, at least those two languages, kind of, maybe others got going in the future. So so um, those are the things I'm working on right now. Uh, there are some other projects uh, that I'm involved with in, uh, with some um, Messianic Bible study that I'm working on as well. So uh, many, many things that are on my heart. And what I really want to say to, uh, to you, Courtney, and to our friends here on, on, on your channel is that I, I invite you to partner with me. I invite you to partner with my ministry because uh, one person or even two <laughs> cannot accomplish much. Yeah. And that in terms of um, administrative help, volunteers, sharing the word, uh, you know, even IT help with things like websites and YouTube channels and, you know, uh, hands are needed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If the Lord would, um, you know, uh, speak to your heart and you would like to support the ministry financially, that would be another great blessing because the ministry is, is real. Uh, it needs some real financial support in order to accomplish our projects. So, right. and, uh, and, and and what I see in the church today, you know, we see the spirit of uh, the, the Laodicean spirit, Revelation chapter three, right? Mm -hmm. Who said that um, I have everything. I don't need you. I don't need your, mm -hmm. I don't need your resources. And, yeah. and, and that's very sad to see. So we have to, again, to uh, join up, to stand up for the gospel, to team up and um, keep doing the work that the Lord has entrusted us in this uh, 
dark time in which we live. So those are the things that I'm working on and God willing, many more down the road. Absolutely. Yeah, no, um, all great things. So guys, if, if you're looking for an extra edge to defend yourself, your faith, um, I'll have all of his stuff in the description box. So everything he just said, he's going to send it to me, going to put it in the description box and feel free to check out all of his statements of faith and all of that. Make sure it all resonates with you and you're on point and you want to um, partner with him and uh, and hopefully push some of the things forward so we can start discipling people. You know, I'm, I'm very much big into discipling people. And uh, if it's something I can at least, you know, bring awareness to and because I live I live in Alabama, so I'm <laughs> I can't physically be there. But the great thing about the Internet is you have the option to fellowship with someone um, miles and miles and miles away and learn from them. And so check out some of his classes, guys, if it seems like it's going to um, I guess online classes pre-recorded. No, th those are live classes. Live. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So is there a question and answer segment if someone doesn't understand? Sure. Great. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, I appreciate you being on Dr. Gehrman for, for those of you who want to reach out to him, um, please go to his websites and, uh, thank you so much. And I, I pray that, uh, I pray that your, your ministry is very blessed. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, Courtney. May the Lord bless you thank and you. we'll keep doing the good job for the kingdom. Awesome. Shalom Aleichem, everybody.